So uh, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us in the Washington, D.C. offices of Mathematica Policy Research. Uh, and also thank you to everyone attending via webinar. Uh, my name is Heinrich Hock, and I'm a senior economist here at Mathematica. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here today to our Disability Policy Forum on helping workers keep their jobs after experiencing an illness, injury, or disability. Uh, this forum is hosted by the Center for Studying Disability Policy, which was established in 2007 to help build the evidence base for sound and effective disability policy. Findings from the center's research are intended to inform policies and programs around the nation to help all Americans with disabilities. Today's forum is sponsored by the Stay at Work, Return to Work Policy Collaborative, which is a project funded by the Office of Disability Employment Policy, or ODEP at the US Department of Labor. ODEP initiated the collaborative to explore policy options that might help workers who experience medical problems stay in the workforce or return to work after recovering. In addition to supporting work, these policies can delay or avoid workers' entry into the SSDI program, Social Security Disability Insurance Program. Since 2013, the collaborative is focused on early intervention options uh, that might help workers when they first experience the onset of a medical problem, and that's typically long before they apply for SSDI. Over the last year, the collaborative is focused especially on what states can do. State staff are closer to the ground on the issues, and they can address them through a variety of state-administered programs. Now, to put the extent of this problem in context, and you know, this is going to be familiar for many in the audience and perhaps those who attended past forums like this, about 2.5 million workers per year leave the labor force, at least temporarily, because of an injury or illness. And so this figure shows the rate of uh, entry into the SSDI program, and we see that about 700,000 to a million workers per year were awarded SSDI benefits between 2002 and 2014. And the fundamental truth is many workers with medical conditions do not get the help they need to stay at work. They must navigate a complicated system of medical care and other services. And if they receive inadequate or inappropriate care, potentially treatable conditions can worsen. And this results in avoidable work disability. And when that happens, it's a tragedy for workers and their families, and society loses a productive member. Earlier this year, the project team calculated the net benefits of successfully helping a worker remain employed after the onset of a medical condition assumed to take place at age 50. And so on the slide now is a, a bar chart showing the net benefits through the age of retirement. And this is calculated from several perspectives. Uh, a key takeaway here is that state work, return to work investments have a win-win potential for state governments, federal governments, and employees. And so states would benefit from increased tax revenues on workers' earnings in the jobs that they retain, as well as lower Medicaid costs and smaller payouts through state assistance programs. The federal government would realize even larger increases in tax revenues and also larger savings on public assistance programs that are funded at the national level. And the employee is uh, the biggest winner here, and that makes sense because he or she can retain the job and the earnings that are associated with it. Now, for employers who are actually not shown on the graph, it's a more complicated story because they directly incur the costs associated, of workplace, associated with workplace accommodations, as well as reduced worker output after an injury or illness. And unfortunately, for many small employers, uh, for many employers, especially small and medium businesses, the net incentive to retain workers may not be very strong. But where the incentive is strong to retain workers, and that's typically for large firms, employers may provide or directly fund uh, state work and return to work services. And these private investments are already taking place and underscore the potential value of expanded public investments of this nature and public-private coordination to support individuals facing work-limiting medical conditions. 
And so today we will hear from the leaders of each of the collaborative's policy work groups um, to present different ideas for addressing this problem. First, uh, Irma Perez Johnson, Associate Director of Human Services Research at Mathematica, will discuss promising behavioral interventions or nudges, as they're called, that could promote a job could promote job retention after the onset of a medical condition. Next, Yonatan Ben Shalom, a senior researcher at Mathematica and project director of the State Work Return to Work Policy Collaborative, will present options that states can pursue to help workers keep their jobs after injury, illness, or disability. Then, Dave Stapleton, director of Mathematica's Center for Studying Disability Policy, will discuss a coordinated community-based workers' compensation program in Washington State that, uh, uh, and how it could be expanded to respond to the onset of off-the-job medical conditions. Their recommendations are outlined in three new policy action papers, which will be available along with uh, companion two-page fact sheets through our project page on the Mathematica's website. And there's a link for that at the end of the slide deck for today's forum. However, please note that today's presentations uh, and the papers on which they are based do not necessarily reflect the user policies of ODEP or any other federal agency. And finally, uh, we are honored to have with us today Jennifer Sheehy and Annette Bourbonaire. Uh, and they will discuss these recommendations uh, from, the, from the policy work group leaders and put them in the context of current government policies and initiatives. Ms. Sheehy is the, acting is the Acting Assistant Secretary of Labor for Disability Employment Policy. And Ms. Bourbonair is a project consultant specializing in healthcare outreach and employer engagement. I'd like to thank both of them for supporting the work presented at today's forum. Uh, before we get started with the presentations, I have a few housekeeping reminders for the audience. Uh, first, our session today includes both in-person attendees and an online audience joining us via webcast. Uh, for those in the room, to help ensure with the highest possible sound quality for our webinar participants, please silence all of your electronic devices. Uh, in addition, we are video recording today's session, and as a result, we may capture images of some of you. The recording will be posted uh, on our website next week. Also, you may follow along with today's event and submit your questions via Twitter. The event hashtag is R2WPolicy. Finally, we will break for questions from both our in-house and our webinar audiences after Yanni speaks and again after Annette Bourbonair speaks. For those of you participating via webinar, Please submit your questions electronically through the Q&A panel on your screen at any time during today's forum. We will alternate your questions from the webinar audience with those from our in-house audience. And with that, I am pleased to turn the podium over to our first presenter, Irma Perez-Johnson. Thank you, Hannah. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me? OK, great. Uh, thank you, Heinrich, and uh, thank you to everyone joining us at the forum here today. I am delighted to have the opportunity to talk to you about uh, the conclusions and recommendations of the policy work group that I help lead on behavioral interventions to promote uh, job retention and uh, after injury or illness. And before I begin, I do want to acknowledge the many contributions of my colleague, Dr. Kara Contreri, a health economist in our Princeton, in our uh, Oakland office, who could not be here today, um, as well as those of uh, our uh, very helpful members of the uh, expert panel, um, who also contributed many, uh, many important insights and ideas to, uh, uh, for the work that I will be presenting here today. <clears throat> Our policy work group examined the events and interactions that can help shape outcomes related to work for workers who experience an injury or illness um, as experienced adults. And, and we try to bring a behavioral lens to those, action, those interactions. And by that, I simply mean taking into account the many psychological, behavioral, and social factors that influence all of our decisions and actions and help us understand why we sometimes procrastinate 
why we sometimes, you know, fail to follow through on important actions and generally act in ways that may not seem fully rational. So, and there are many, many examples of that. So, um, with that charge in mind, um, we try to identify the key actors and interactions that may help shape stay at work and return outcomes. So, for example, clearly when a worker first experiences a, work a potentially work-limiting condition, they'll try to seek information about that condition from friends, colleagues, you know, sort of coworkers, um, the internet and the like. And obviously the information that they find will help shape their decisions about staying at work or, rem or um, returning to work. Um, they will also seek care for their condition from a physician. And it's important to understand that physicians are highly influential, authoritative figures in that process. The, whatever advice, medical advice they, they provide and recommendations will carry a lot of weight with workers and will help shape their expectations for recovery and, and their understanding of their prospects for returning to work. Um, at that point in time, the worker may, may return to work um, and, uh, and or like request a temporary leave for, from uh, their employment. So obviously at some point their employer will also become, um, become aware of uh, their condition and how their res the employer, um, him or herself, responds to the worker's condition will also be influential in the worker's ultimate outcomes. And finally, the worker will also may apply for uh, short-term compensation, uh, workers uh, short-term disability workers' compensation, or long-term disability. Um, and the insurers who actually provide financial support while workers are not able to work, um, through their actions and their policies, will ultimately also intentionally or unintentionally shape uh, uh, these uh, these work-related outcomes. As we examined these interactions, our hope and our goal was to identify common pitfalls or factors that may unintentionally or um, uh, unnecessarily be contributing to workers leaving, uh, leaving the workforce. Um, so for example, um, what were some of these potential reasons why workers may unnecessarily leave, uh, leave the, the workforce? So uh, considering first workers, it seemed possible that maybe they may be struggling with decisions about remaining or returning to work um, just because of the, the stress they're under when first experiencing um, a new medical condition, their uncertainty, or the financial and physical hardship that they're experiencing from their, uh, from their condition. Um, obviously, decisions about returning to work, balancing their, their new health needs and, uh, and, work, uh, and work responsibilities are likely to be complex. And uh, that complexity may also contributing to workers just being unable to make decisions about returning or, uh, or remaining at work. Um, they may also underestimate their, their capacity to adapt or improve over time, you know, when first, when first uh, faced with these conditions. And finally, they may be painting for themselves an overly rosy picture of what life on long-term disability may be like and underestimate the many social, psychological, and financial benefits of remaining at work in the long, time, uh, in the long term. So these are all potential factors that may contribute to workers unnecessarily leave the workforce. Focusing next on physicians, I think most of us would recognize that physicians have limited time and attention to focus on issues beyond the workers' immediate health concerns when they, when they fa face uh, a worker needing treatment. And um, for many, especially primary care providers, um, I think one of the, the themes that came strongly from our discussions was that many of them have never received treatment, um, training, direct training on uh, the treatment of work-limiting conditions and disabilities and are not familiar with evidence-based guidelines for time off for work or referral to specialists. Finally, focusing on employers, it seemed uh, possible that many of them underestimate the potential benefits of keeping the work, the worker um, at, their, at their job and overestimate the hassles and the costs of making accommodations. Having identified these you know, potential barriers or so-called behavioral bottlenecks, we could then focus on strategies that may help address these issues and therefore help more workers remain and return at work. And um, before I get into this one, I wanted to point out that in our paper, 
we also not only discuss these various intervention strategies, but also try to prioritize those that seem to have some promising evidence of effectiveness that uh, seem feasible in the sense that we could identify a potential funder, an administrator, uh, as well as a trigger for their deployment. Um, and finally, those that seem to have the potential to be implemented at scale, since this is a problem that we're, you know, we're really trying to affect on a large scale. Um, this first intervention I wanted to highlight for you, multi-party dialogues, is an intervention that was inspired by um, a mandatory program uh, for Norwegian workers who go on long-term, um, on uh, extended leave from their jobs. And the idea here would be to bring together the worker, an insurer representative, a medical proxy, and insurer together to develop a plan and timeline for the worker to return to work, if that is in fact feasible. Um, to illustrate, again, our thinking on why we thought this would be promising, we envisioned that an intervention like this could be triggered by um, the submission of a claim for workers' compensation or short-term disability, or the request for, an, ex for uh, an extended leave from work. The funder could be an insurer, a state, or the federal government. And an, a program like this one could be administered um, through an ins the insurer, them uh, insurer itself, the, an employee assistance program, employer resource network, or even our public workforce system. So there are many different options here. In addition, there were uh, several other strategies that we could envision implementing in combination with these multi-party dialogues or tested on their own. For example, it seemed, um, it seemed desirable to make available to um, injured uh, workers or workers who face a condition like this to give them access to, uh, to periodic sessions with a job retention coach that may have special, specialized training on the treatment of these disabilities and return to work issues. Um, and uh, the goal of these sessions would be to procure the, the best, most appropriate outcome for the worker. So it's not an idea of always pushing for work, but pushing for work and helping the worker return to work when it's in fact advantageous. And this, uh, as we considered this idea, it seemed um, feasible to model it or to uh, build it on a program like Washington State Centers for Occupational Health and Education, or COHE, which you'll hear more about from my colleague David Stapleton. In addition, again, because people may be underestimating the, uh, the benefits from remaining at work and overestimating the benefits of uh, going on long-term disability, it seemed desirable to provide financial counseling, perhaps facilitated by some sort of uh, structured online tool um, that to, again, cultivate more realistic expectations. And interesting, interestingly, there are existing examples of such a tool, and we found Disability Benefits 101. Um, which, uh, again, illustrate the feasibility of this uh, concept. Finally, it seemed uh, desirable to potentially offer bonuses or other incentives for workers to return to work. And in our view, this, this was an intervention that could, in fact, be anchored um, or tied to milestones in a return to work plan, um, like uh, one developed under multi-party dialogues or through job search, uh, job return to work coaching. And there are examples of these kinds of programs um, from uh, the unemployment insurance system that have been tested in the past and shown uh, promising. Finally, um, interventions based on electronic health records seem promising as promising strategies to address some of the bottlenecks we found for, uh, from, uh, 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 for physicians. And here, it seemed feasible to, uh, based on the diagnosis codes that are entered into electronic health records, uh, display guidelines or uh, for treatment or time of for work or other information that is particular, re particularly relevant in that instance, and therefore help uh, physicians make more appropriate, um, more appropriate uh, recommendations for workers. And I won't go into the details of uh, this particular intervention. In our paper, we discuss several other strategies um, and approaches that may be uh, promising in helping address the behavioral uh, bottlenecks identified, including a broad information campaign modeled after one in Australia that help address uh, misconceptions about the proper treatment of uh, lower back pain, one of the leading causes of long-term disability here in the United States. 
physician education programs to help uh, familiarize them with, uh, you know, the benefits of keeping workers attached to work. And finally, um, uh, including employment as some uh, quality metric in, for healthcare systems and providers as a strategy to um, better incentivizing physicians uh, for work, uh, focusing on work-related issues and compensating them for the time they spend on such issues. Um, and with that, you know, sort of there's the information for myself and Kara Contrary, and I look forward to your comments and questions as well as those of our discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Can you hear me? Okay, so um, my paper is about uh, promising early intervention options for states who are interested in helping workers keep their jobs after injury, illness, or disability. And uh, we think that states can take a variety of sta uh, steps, and some states are already doing that, uh, to fill the gaps in the fragmented system that Heinrich described earlier. So uh, I also had a distinguished group of uh, policy work group experts. I won't uh, list them, uh, name them all, but they're listed here. Uh, and I uh, also want to thank some other people who uh, engaged with me with the discussion over the phone. Um, some very interesting discussions and uh, suggestions. Um, so we focused this year on what states can do because states are closer to the ground, as uh, Heinrich mentioned. And we also think they have an array of tools to address uh, some of these problems. They regularly interact with employers and workers through the workforce development, VR, workers' compensation, health, and other agencies. Um, and these agencies do have tools to promote better outcomes. Um, and as, as you'll soon see, some states have already taken steps to help. And in some cases, the programs uh, at least some, uh, somewhat address the behavioral bottlenecks that Irma had mentioned. However, states do face some significant challenges that hinder their ability to provide uh, timely job retention services to workers who could benefit from them. Uh, first and perhaps foremost, there's a general lack of awareness and leadership in states regarding the problem of job loss following injury or illness, um, despite the large number of workers who leave the labor force and enter SSDI. For a given state, it could be a tens of thousands of people every year. Uh, there are several reasons for this. Uh, the issue generally lacks visibility. There's a lack of recognition that job loss and workforce withdrawal have substantial negative consequences and are often preventable. And there's a misalignment of the costs and benefits associated with the workers' departure from the labor force. Uh, as you've seen in the cost-benefit analysis, uh, the savings to the federal gov government are much larger than they are to the state. So the state doesn't have too much of an incentive compared to the federal government to do something about it. Another challenge is that relevant state agencies have not traditionally focused on workers at risk of losing their jobs. If you think about state workforce agencies, they're investing in helping unemployed people get back into the labor force. And state VR agencies mostly serve individuals with significant disabilities who either have never worked before or been out of the labor force for some, for some time and typically have limited capacity to serve those already employed. And uh, I'll soon uh, talk about some states that are uh, addressing those issues um, despite those challenges. Finally, some states uh, have to make difficult funding decisions regarding competing priorities and they face considerable constraints in terms of fragmentation of the state agency responsibilities, limited capacity to do more, and entrenchment of a status quo in which various stakeholders, lawyers, physicians, advocates, often guide workers toward applying for disability benefits rather than remaining in the labor force. However, um, despite these challenges, we have fairly recent development that enhanced states' ability to provide timely job retention services to workers who benefit from them. Um, WIOA includes an amendment to the Rehab Act, which authorizes the use of VR funds for job retention of current employees who require specific services of equipment to maintain employment, regardless of whether that state uh, has an order of selection or if that person was uh, formerly a VR client. A second significant development is a revision to the rule implementing Section 503 of the Rehab Act, and that rules, uh, rule uh, uh, requires federal contractors and subcontractors to aspire to increase to 7% the percentage of their employees with disabilities. Um, and one way they could do that is help uh, workers who experience disability uh, stay at work. Um, so they might, uh, we might see an increase in demand for job retention services uh, from uh, employees, uh, employers trying to uh, achieve that 7% goal. 
Another relevant development is the expansion of the health insurance coverage under ACA, both through Medicaid and the ACA exchanges. States, states could potentially uh, use the leverage to promote uh, better state work and return to work practices among physicians. Um, and finally, the concept of states as a model employer for people with disabilities has gained a lot of traction in recent years, uh, with many states uh, uh, leading by example in hiring individuals with disabilities, and this concept could also be applied to retention of workers with uh, newly acquired disabilities, which are the focus of today's presentations. Um, and I know that there are many in the private sector uh, in the audience today, and I do want to mention that uh, ma many of these workers who work in the private sector are not covered by private disability insurance, um, and uh, in many cases their conditions are not workers' compensation. Um, so all of you out there are doing great work uh, in, in, in some of those programs. You, you need to realize that there's a lot of workers who fall through the cracks and don't actually uh, see anybody who can help them apart from their physician. Um, so where have states intervened to improve care and reduce costs? Uh, there are a few systems in which uh, we see this, and uh, the table shows four primary avenues for intervention and their respective target populations. Um, early identification and engagement of workers who need help is relatively straightforward in workers' comp. Uh, workers with job-related injury or illness are required to file a claim, um, and the benefits include both income replacement and medical care, uh, which gives a lot of leverage uh, uh, in those systems to, to help, and uh, we do see a lot of uh, activity there. Uh, in the five states with mandatory short-term disability insurance programs, uh, early identification and engagement is also easier because there is a claim. Uh, however, uh, most of the states uh, don't do much, uh, and we'll get... Uh, to Rhode Island soon, uh, which is a state that is doing more than the others are. Uh, in state VR agencies, uh, that's another opportunity for early state intervention, and uh, I mentioned the WIOA amendment already that makes that easier to do. Um, however, in VR, there is no filing of claims to receive benefits that would trigger the provision of services, so they really need to rely on some kind of uh, robust referral system. Finally, states can intervene with their own employees through their administration of health insurance, disability insurance, and other benefits, States employ million of workers. Uh, most of them are not covered by uh, group disability insurance. So um, through this work, we found some small pockets where states have intervened to improve care and reduce costs with varying degrees of scope and evidence of success. Uh, a prominent example is, again, Washington's workers' compensation system, which Dave will talk about uh, soon. Um, as I mentioned, uh, in state short-term disability insurance, to our knowledge, Rhode Island uh, is the only state uh, that has implemented changes uh, really targeting uh, improvements in return to work outcomes for claimants. Uh, after a task force in 2005, uh, they started a partial return to work program where workers can <coughs> return to work on a part-time basis and still receive part of their benefits. Um, and Rhode Island also requires the physicians to follow evidence-based guidelines uh, for the duration of time of work. Um, and after the task force recommended uh, these changes, uh, these changes were implemented uh, within a year. And, and that has been around since 2006. Um, quite a few states operate VR programs that are dedicated to helping retaining employees who need assistance to stay at work. Uh, we mentioned Alabama and Arkansas here. Uh, we had people from their uh, agencies on our policy work group, but we know that there are a few other VR agencies um, and uh, Alabama, for example, has a program called Retaining a Valued Employee, or RAVE, and it offers employers and employees in Alabama a single point of contact uh, who rapidly assesses an individual's needs and arranges for assistance accordingly. Uh, the Arkansas program is similar to that, um, but it is important to recognize that these programs help only a few hundred workers each year, while these states um, have thousands of workers who enter SSDI each year. So the, uh, there's a really room to do more there. Um, and I'm sure the agencies want to do more, uh, but don't have necessarily the funding or capacity to do it. Finally, Delaware's Return to Work program uh, stood out to us uh, in that it's a state that has disability insurance coverage for their employees and also a coordinated program to help them return to work quickly. Uh, there's a Return to Work coordinator that people know that they can turn to, and that coordinator works with the disability insurance carrier to help uh, get people back to work as soon as possible. So in the paper, we present a menu of options for specific steps that states can take to increase access to job retention services for workers uh, who need those services but do not currently receive them. Uh, 
We think that the most appropriate course of action will vary from state to state, develop, uh, depending on the capabilities of agencies in that state. Um, so what do we recommend? Uh, let's start with what we've called claims-based interventions, uh, where there's a claim that triggers, can trigger uh, uh, the services of the three states with public workers' compensation funds, North Dakota, Ohio, and Wyoming, uh, can potentially uh, uh, learn from Washington, Washington's uh, COE program that they will talk about. Uh, but any state workers' compensation uh, system, whether it's monopolistic or competitive, uh, could pilot test employment and accommodation subsidy programs uh, such as Oregon and Washington, uh, or follow Ohio's uh, Bureau of Workers Compensation program, uh, where they provide training and incentives to encourage employers to develop and implement traditional work programs. Uh, then we have the states uh, with uh, the short-term disability insurance programs. Uh, they could learn from uh, Rhode Island's experience with introducing a partial return to work program. Um, but these these states could also uh, uh, pilot test proactive case coordination and behavioral interventions. Uh, such as uh, both Irma and, and Dave are, uh, have or will cover. Um, and then Delaware and any other state government that, that provides its employees with DI coverage could pilot test a variety of programs, uh, including partial return to work, proactive case coordination, uh, implementing disability duration guidelines, and behavioral interventions. Um, as I mentioned, most states do not offer private disability insurance coverage to their employees, so uh, they might want to consider offering uh, that, um, but they do need to be proactive about promoting return to work uh, for that to make sense. Uh, and these are the recommendations for what we've called referral-based interventions, where we don't have a claim to trigger the event. Uh, state with VR agencies have already uh, provide job retention services, um, but really uh, need to think about how they can do more to boost referrals to their services um, and to increase their capacity to do more. All states can consider the merits of pilot testing the COHI approach uh, that they will talk about, uh, adapted for off-the-job cases within the healthcare systems, um, and some of the ideas mentioned by Irma can uh, fit in there too. Uh, finally, states already provide EAB, most states provide EAP benefits to their employees, um, and they can consider how to work with that EAP provider uh, to focus more on retention of workers, um, including with those with mental illness. And other states can consider the merits of offering EAP benefits to the employees to begin with. So to conclude, how do we move forward? Uh, the promising initiatives we recommend for states leverage existing programs and private sector capabilities. It can be tested fairly rapidly by states in partnership with the private sector. And while some states have acted on their own, others could be encouraged to do so with backing from the federal government. Uh, as we've shown in the cost-benefit analysis, the federal government is the one that stands to gain uh, more than the states do, and really could play a role here. And uh, we think multiple federal agencies will need to coordinate between them to make that happen. Uh, we also know there is some movement in that direction already with both the president's budget for 2017 and recent legislation proposing an interagency council on workforce attachment. I guess we'll wait and see. Thank you. I can cut the QA short. All right, well, thank you, Yanni. Uh, with that, we're going to head into some questions for the first two presenters. A couple requests going in. Uh, one, please make sure to state your name and affiliation when asking a question, and please limit yourself to just one question, if you could. Uh, for those in the room, there'll be a microphone that'll come to you. Please speak into it so people in the webinar audience can hear you. <coughs> and for those attending online, please continue submitting your questions via the webinar's Q&A panel via Twitter. Uh, sorry, via the webinar's Q&A panel, or you can do it using Twitter uh, with the hashtag R2WPolicy. So uh, I guess we'll start with a question uh, in the room. If anybody, just raise your hand. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Mary Campbell with the um, D.C. Department of Behavioral Health, and I am our ADA coordinator and a modified duty return to work um, officer. You mentioned the 504, but you left out the ADA. Um, I use it a lot to help and keep workers um, back on the job or getting them back to job, modifying their job duties. Was that intentional? Um, no, no, it was not intentional. Um, I mean, I think you, you make a good point. We are talking about a sort of new developments. The ADA has been around for a while. Um, uh, 
Yeah, and we 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 have a paper from last year where we uh, touch on the ADA, the role of the ADA uh, more directly. Um, I can look back if, and, and see if I touched on it in my paper. But again, we're we're focusing on you know new opportunities and. Um, it's it's worth reiterating, but I do want to make that point that it's, it's been around for 25 years now, right? Um, and we need to think about ways to, yes, enforce it, I guess, where it, it's relevant. I didn't say we should change it. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I think we're maybe take a question from the webinar audience now. Sure. This question is from Lynette Henderson from Vanderbilt University. Um, the question is, um, have you given any thought to invisible or progressive genetic conditions that make it difficult to know what days you might feel well enough to work? Or instances like me where I struggle at, in a full-time status faculty position even with FMLA and disability status? I'll start and see if you might have anything yeah. to add. Um, I think it's a great question. I think uh, you know we realize through this work that uh, there's so much heterogeneity in, in conditions, and um, you know, in my uh, presentation, and we talked about you know what could trigger the help, um, and the claim is the easy case where there is an obvious trigger, uh, but these other cases, you know whether it's invisible or not, sometimes it, it takes time for the worker themselves to know that down the line uh, this might be a problem, so it, it's able uh, easier to address it sooner. Uh, but for a person who has an invisible disability, it's really, um, I, I think that's one reason why, uh, you know, information campaign like Irma uh, talked about could make sense to, to raise awareness that, um, you know, there are many people who have uh, certain conditions that you know are not we might not know about them unless somebody discloses it, and even then the question is you know how do you handle the day to day um, issues with it yeah I, I think I agree with everything yoni said and and I think you know that's a perfect example of a situation where mo these multi party dialogues may be particularly important in helping educate the employer as to, you know, sort of the, the specifics of that, that condition, you know, sort of, and, and perhaps, you know, sort of help, uh, help achieve a more, you know, sort of a more satisfactory arrangement, you know, for the worker where, you know, sort of where perhaps they're given more flexibility, you know, sort of, and, and just come, come to uh, a, an agreeable solution. But um, I think, again, it, just information and that sharing and, and joint learning is r really critical. <clears throat> All right, I think we have time for uh, at least another question. Um, my name is Lauren Gilbert with Georgetown's Global Social Enterprise Initiative, and my question is um, to Ms. Perez Johnson. Um, you mentioned very briefly an Australian information campaign, yeah. um, but I was wondering if you could go into a little bit more detail about it. Sure. Um, so the campaign I was referring to, um, you know, I'm, I don't remember the exact timing of it, but it was within the last 10 years. And, um, and it aimed to uh, educate both the broad, ge the general public and, uh, and physicians and individuals involved in the treatment of individuals with lower back pain as to what were appropriate treatments and, for example, that it's, it's uh, ill-advised to tell a person to sort of uh, rest a lot and not move and, you know, that in fact, you know, sort of what practices could actually worsen the condition. Uh, the campaign was also paired with uh, direct information for physicians on treatment options and guidelines, you know, sort of, again, more detailed information that would be particularly relevant for the physicians. And um, interestingly, you know, sort of uh, in following up, you know, sort of with physicians and both the, the uh, survey of the general public, they found a, a significant shift in attitudes towards lower back pain, changes in actual knowledge about what was appropriate uh, treatment um, and, uh, and uh, what were co counterindicated, you know, sort of strategies. Um, as well as lower medical claims, lower medical expenses uh, with these conditions. So, and there's a couple of interesting papers that we reference in our um, in our paper 
that then project if a campaign like this were to be implemented in the United States, the potential savings, health savings, medical savings, and uh, reductions in long-term disability, and the numbers are actually quite impressive. So, um, you know, sort of, I, I would welcome, you know, you're reading the paper, and please get in touch if you have any further questions. So, so it's uh, it will be released later today or later this week, and there's a link. Today. Huh? Today. Today. So, um, and it will be available online, and the link is in, in the slides. It's on the back of the slides. So I think we have time for one more question from the webinar audience. Yes, um, this question is from Lee Coslow from Rochester Works in Rochester, New York. The question is, um, is there any data available on individuals who leave the workforce and begin to receive SSDI segmented by industry? I think I might let, do you, do you want to answer this? <laughs> <laughs> well, you looked at incidents of SSDI. Um, uh, actually, there have been some studies on that, but I can't. Um, the the SIP, a uh, couple studies using the SIP. Uh, one of them I think is on our website. If they send us an email, we can provide more specific reference. Yeah, Dave, Dave has a paper looking at incidents of uh, entry into SSDI by certain employer characteristics, but I don't know. But how industry much. is not one of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know that's what you wanted me to say. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'll pass it off to David Stapleton, who's going to talk about a promising workers' compensation model and some interesting ways that it could be scaled up. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Uh, okay. So uh, I get to talk about uh, COHI. It's an, uh, an early intervention that has proven to be successful within workers' compensation. Uh, and the question that I'm asking is, uh, can it work outside of workers' compensation? And the short answer is we really don't know, uh, but it would be well worth conducting a pilot to figure that out. But the first question I want to answer is, where can you find a COHI? And here it is, the other Washington. Hmm. Um, COHI stands for Center for Occupational Health and Education, as I think Irma mentioned earlier. And uh, I will talk about what a COHI is in a minute and its success in workers' compensation. But first, let me give some credit to the important people. Uh, we had a policy work group that provided a lot of expertise uh, on, on COHIs and what could potentially be done outside of workers' compensation. I want to give a shout out to a couple of people. Jennifer Christian, who's sitting right here in the front row. She's actually the co-author of the paper that will be out later this week. Uh, not today, I think, but, but, but hopefully by Friday. And, um, and she also accompanied me on a visit to the state of Washington, where we talked a lot for the state's Department of Labor and Industries, which is the public workers' compensation fund uh, in, in Washington, and uh, has been around for a long time and is well known in this area. Uh, we also benefited greatly from talking to people on the site visit that I meant, just mentioned. Here's a list of them. Uh, these are mostly people in state government or in uh, industry or labor, and uh, they provide a lot of uh, interesting information to us. Uh, let's see. Here we go. All right, so what is a, what is a COHI? I've uh, tried to avoid saying that long enough. So a COHI is a really a private sector organization that is designed to address some of the behavioral bottlenecks that Irma described. It works with all parties involved in a workers' compensation claim. Uh, first, the worker, an injured worker down at the bottom. Providers, starting with the physician, uh, but also other types of providers, like uh, rehabilitation providers. Uh, certainly, the employer. The employer has a very strong interest in uh, getting the worker back to work. Uh, and then labor and industries itself, the, the workers' compensation agency. So the COHI works with all of them to try to ensure that the outcome of the case is optimal in the sense of optimal return to function, optimal return to work. Uh, how do they do that? Well, they conduct two sorts of activities. And I'm going to tell you the first one, which I often forget if I put it second, is uh, they really try to identify what best practices are teach the stakeholders about pre best practices, make sure that they're being used. Uh, when there are new things coming along, they're the ones who are helping 
uh, stakeholders implement them. So that's kind of a community service activity for all of the stakeholders in the community. Uh, the other one, and the, the one that they spend most of their time on, is monitoring individual cases. They have professionals who have been trained to monitor individual workers' compensation cases from day one. They do this mostly electronically by a, by a, a management information system that they've got. And uh, when they see a problem, they identify a potential problem, some cases progressing more slowly, something's not getting done. They can call up uh, one of the stakeholders and say, what's going on? They can work with the people involved to devise a plan to address what the issue is. But primarily, they're trying to stop, you know, get rid of those behavioral bottlenecks that can, that can result in bad outcomes when there's a perfectly reasonable treatment that ought to lead to the person getting back to work timely. So that's what they do. <clears throat> it's important to recognize that they're only doing this inside workers' compensation now. Uh, and that means that they're embedded in what's a relatively integrated care system. There's a single payer that's paying for everything, the workers' comp insurer. It also has its own case managers who are following each claim in a different way. Uh, they, the workers are all getting, if they're missing substantial work, they're getting wage replacement or indemnity payments, also paid by the same workers' comp insurer. There are incentives built into the system for employers to cooperate with return to work, partly because uh, the, the insurance industry recognizes that getting the person back to work is going to save them money. Uh, and then uh, there are also VR services, which, which the agency itself provides, the workers' compensation agency. So that's all there. So work, COHI is, is working within that system. Uh, it's really important to recognize that if any one of the stakeholder organizations that is involved in COE did not support it, COE would not exist, right? There's the, the workers, you know, labor, uh, industry, and, and providers, and, and also, of course, uh, the workers' comp agency are all really instrumental. And that, that, that it really reflects what happened with how COE was developed in the first place. It was developed by the stakeholders because they recognized there are significant problems with medical care and other services and workers not getting back to work timely. And they tested it, uh, in, and they had a very successful pilot in the early 2000s. And after that, uh, it was implemented statewide. So here are the results from the pilot in summary. And this is great. You know, it's a very successful pilot, pilot because all of, the, all of the outcomes were negative. Uh, uh, they, they, at the end of 12 months, they had a 21% reduction in the number of workers who were not working. Right? Who, uh, so it was 21% they, were, they were, went back to work instead. Uh, for, for lower back sprain cases, it was a 37% reduction. That's huge. Uh, the medical costs um, were reduced by 7% for both types of ca all cases and lower back sprain cases as well. Uh, and that's after taking into account the extra cost of paying the doctors to work with the COHES and, uh, and to communicate with other stakeholders uh, and for the COHES services themselves. Uh, the disability cost savings were much larger this is the, the wage compensation payments, and lost their work days were also much larger. So there are a lot of savings in those 12 months. Those understate the total savings because the savings to workers' comp continued after 12 months because we already had more people back to work at the 12-month mark. And in addition, there are savings that accrued outside of workers' compensation. And in fact, um, after eight years, the, uh, the state, the workers' compensation people in Washington think that they have actually reduced the number of claimants who went on to enter SSDI by 8%, by 25%, I'm sorry. Now that's an estimate, it's preliminary, but it's consistent with a 21% reduction in uh, not employment after, after 12 months. And we're actually pursuing a project to try to, to firm that number up. So uh, the question that uh, um, we really posed is, you know, where are the opportunities to use cohort services elsewhere? And Yanni already mentioned that other public workers' compensation insurers, that seems an obvious thing, and even private ones potentially, large employers where the employer is paying for disability benefits and health insurance benefits, it would re be in their interest if they're not already doing something uh, to, to do something. And that could include state and federal governments. Uh, but we are focused on other workers, workers who have conditions that are not compensable under workers' compensation. They uh, don't have private disability insurance. Many of them work for small employers or medium-sized employers. 
They have relatively low skills, relatively low levels of education, relatively low wages, the kinds of workers that disproportionately end up getting on to SSDI uh, after leaving the labor force. And there are many challenges to doing this outside of workers' compensation. The first is that there's tremendous fragmentation in the service delivery system that creates, reinforces the bottlenecks that occur with inside workers' compensation. Workers have to navigate this healthcare system by itself. Uh, rehabilitation and return to work services are, are available sometimes, but they have no guidance on how to get them. Uh, institutions don't support collaborating with each other. And in fact, there are certain barriers like the HIPAA, the uh, privacy rules for health, health information that make it very difficult to communicate across stakeholders. Uh, and so that, that's a real challenge for COHI, but it's also a real promising uh, opportunity because it's exactly those sorts of bottlenecks that COE has been designed to uh, get rid of, to identify and figure out how to get around. Uh, in addition, outside of workers' compensation, the financing is much more limited and it's, itself is highly fragmented. Substantial funding is available from health insurers, but they often don't pay for the sorts of things that would help a person get back to work more quickly. There's also uh, vocational rehabilitation funding and Medicaid funding, but those are in separate programs, not integrated, and they, they have limited funding. Uh, Out-of-pocket expenses for the worker can be high, so there can be a substantial burden on the worker, and it's at a time when the worker outside of workers' comp may not be receiving any sort of compensation, wage replacement. Uh, and then in addition, and really importantly, incentives for employers outside of workers' compensation are much weaker than with inside, within workers' compensation because we don't have the sorts of systems in place that workers' compensation have to make it in the employer's interest to, to help the worker come back. But uh, despite all of these challenges, we do think it would be feasible to test uh, a, a COE system outside of workers' compensation in Washington state. There is substantial uh, support among leaders that we talk to in among the, all the stakeholder or organizations in Washington. We, they think and we think that they could follow the path of conducting a pilot like they did inside workers' compensation. We've actually developed a preliminary design for the pilot <coughs> and also a rigorous evaluation to go up along with it. We think it would take four to five years to get that thing up and running from, one, from the point at which a decision is made to go forward. I'm sorry, to, to get it up and running and complete it and complete the evaluation would take four to five years. However, it's not gonna happen well, several other things happen first. One is state leaders need to step up and say, we want to do this. And I think right now there's probably interest in doing that, but they see too many other obstacles. And the other obstacles is they see that they need federal support, and they need two types of federal support. First is just administrative support, because some of the programs that would be involved in a test are programs that are funded by federal agencies and, and over which federal agencies have regulatory authority. And the second is financial support. As Yanni said, a lot of the benefits of this system would accrue to the federal government, particularly Social Security programs and, <clears throat> and Medicare. And the states have no way to benefit from those savings. Uh, so they really need support. It would make it in their fiscal interest to go forward with a pilot like this, which would, I think, need to come from a federal agency or <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> maybe potentially a foundation. So. So that's it. I, I think there is an opportunity here to do a pilot, but uh, it's going to take getting over some barriers to doing a pilot uh, before we can actually get it done. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dave. Uh, in just a moment, Jennifer Sheehy will give us her thoughts on recommendations on the recommendations we've just heard and how they might uh, inform uh, federal return to work policies. And then we'll hear from Annette Bourbonair on how today's presentations relate to current state and local return to work policies. And after that, we'll have another round of questions and answers that'll address your questions for Dave Stapleton, Ms. Sheehy, and Ms. Bourbonair. Uh, and we'll then open up uh, for a general Q&A. And just as a reminder for our webinar audience, we'd love to hear from you still. So please keep submitting your questions now on the Q&A panel uh, on your screen. And with that, I will pass things off to Jennifer Sheehy. Thank you so much, and thank you to Mathematica for hosting this forum. It's nice to see you all here. I'm Jennifer Sheehy, and I'm with the Office of Disability Employment Policy, 
like to recognize two of my expert colleagues, Meredith Dodona and Michael Reardon as well. So all questions can be referred to them <laughs> and funding requests. So um, let me tell you a little bit about ODEP, ODEP first. We are a small non-regulatory federal agency that focuses exclusively on employment policy that will help support people with disabilities to stay in the workplace or return to work. So it is um, natural for us to look at this um, look at this issue in this topic. Mathematica has been our um, colleague for the last three years studying this and also operating a community of practice. Because we're a small federal agency and because policy is um, not done just at the federal level, it has to work for everybody. We often engage in what we call a community of practice and we bring together physicians, researchers, policy experts, um, disability insurers, employers, and professionals in disability management to talk to, listen to, give us feedback on what might be a policy solution. And frankly, these days, policy has to work harder than ever before. It not only has to show before policy is recommended that there might be evidence for a policy to work. It has to um, not have unintentional consequences. We all live with policies now that have had unintentional consequences and, and certainly um, Social Security is trying to address some of those. And finally, it has to save money. Policy has to save money. It can't cost uh, beyond the, the money that goes into, into the policies. So what does that mean exactly? That means we need to look at things like Irma was talking about, behavioral nudges, where People do things that are for their benefit, whether they have a natural resistance to them or not. And we've done that with Georgetown Business School and with Wharton Business School in looking at employer behavior and what will prompt employer behavior to hire and retain people with disabilities where their natural instinct and maybe bias, unconscious or conscious bias, may be um, causing them to resist that something that is good for their bottom line. So what is the federal role? We, we often look at what the federal role is in this space, and it's really to look at policy levers or those uh, nudges that will, will promote the private sector to take on and sustain something like employment for people with disabilities, where there is a benefit for all parties involved. Federal, uh, employ federal agencies often seed demonstrations where there might not be an incentive or it may be a very high, uh, high cost to test policies. And then we also try to look at the, you know, convene all the different stakeholders involved to make sure that policies are benefiting or, or that all the players involved that need to be involved have some kind of benefit or at least no significant cost that they can't sustain. And uh, we do work very, very closely with Social Security, with HHS, Health and Human Services, with Research Institute's Department of Education because they're all integral to addressing these issues. And, um, and there haven't been reasons for all these agencies before to coordinate because not one of those agencies, as you've heard, has a direct role in a, and accountability for keeping people at work and um, getting them before they apply for Social Security disability insurance. And ODEP as a non-regulatory agency is a perfect um, organization to convene those members and bring them to the table. So um, 
some of the interesting things that have come out of this and, and we hope to carry forward are, you know, putting together, based on all, everything we're learning, ideas for demonstrations that as federal agencies we might be able to partner to, um, to fund and also to uh, recommend to um, our Office of Management and Budget and a budget justification. We, uh, a lot of what we've heard today uh, means we need to have a little bit more data. Where are people coming from who will ultimately go into or apply for SSDI and can we reach them early? We've heard, uh, we know there's research out there that supports a almost a 12-week sweet spot where we have to intervene or th those folks who um, can use those services to, re to stay at work or return to work will be lost. They will apply for SSDI and then once on those benefits have very little chance um, and reason to get off of those benefits. So perhaps short-term disability you know, there are some promising um, practices there. SSDI as a, a short-term bridge, that was my personal case. That's how I used SSDI. I had to have it. I had to have Medicaid. I had needed a two-year um, two year window to finish school and then establish myself at the workplace so that I could earn enough to support all my new medical and personal assistant needs. But without that, I would not be able to, su to sustain work. So are there um, promising practices there? Um, we don't have a lot of time today to talk about those, but we uh, encourage you to engage with us further after the webinar and please um, field, we are happy to field more questions as you look at those papers that our wonderful researchers and policy group have put together and um, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to serve you as taxpayers and hopefully make a difference in this field. Yeah, I have, uh, I'm excited actually to participate in this um, because I'm, I'm excited to see that we're looking now at prevention rather than uh, fixing, um, you know, it's much easier to stop somebody from falling into the well than to try to pull them out. And, and that's, that's what I always think of with Social Security disability. And um, for, this is also good not only for the individual but for the system. And when we're focusing on the individual, we are helping the system. And that's uh, the opposite of what's been happening in the past. So this is really good. Uh, one of the, uh, Irma in her paper, she talked a lot about information being key. And I can tell you that the information that is generally provided is so far from what is reality. Um, there's not only a financial loss by losing your job, but there's a career loss. You, there's no way you're going to go back and step into your career where you left off. And there's the loss of social context where everything around you has changed. Um, from the people that I've counseled doing job development, it's been, I can sum up their comments with, I have nothing to do and no money to do it with. And that's what being on disability is for a lot of people. And it's not where we want things to be. The role of the Affordable Care Act, I think, has, or it's time. It's, it's a good place for it to be right now. Um, it, those extraordinary disability related costs that are beyond the cost, the capability of individuals, um, could be covered possibly through a Medicaid wraparound. So the individual can go to work, buy traditional health insurance, and have Medicaid hopefully cover those extraordinary costs without penalty. I know that my story was the opposite of Jennifer's. I actually did work. Um, for 20 years, I had to self-insure because I was unable to buy health insurance. 
and finally just had to give up and go on disability so I could get coverage for these costs. Um, so it, this is a, an important thing to have in place. I know Yanni talked a bit about the Rhode Island program, and we're looking at that right now. Rhode Island was the first state in the country to have a temporary disability insurance. And uh, we're looking at the past uh, five years of their uh, use of the partial benefits, uh, the partial return to work benefits. And I can tell you that for those who participate in the partial return to work benefits, their average time out of work is 7.78 weeks versus those who do not participate in it whose uh, average out of work is 15.04 weeks, which is a really significant difference. Um, this is after removing maternity, which is a separate disability case. So, you know, there is room for such things as this in uh, policy to look at ways to help. I, I look at it more as a transition than waiting for recovery. Uh, somebody with a disability, I mean, we're not talking about just those with a cold and go back to work, but somebody with an ongoing disability where there may not be a medical recovery, if, you, if you're trying to go from not working to working, you, it may be an impossible task. You're going from not working to working full time and it's like, oh my gosh, this is way more than I can handle and it may discourage them from going on further. Where with a transition, and they offer a transition of up to eight weeks, where you can get partial benefits while you're working up to your normal work schedule. And I think that that makes a tremendous difference in the ability of people to reach their employment goals. And I think other incentives that we're talking about have the same potential and they should be tested. I think it's a really exciting time to be looking at these things. One other thing that we, we've talked about, and, and I want to be careful how I put this, but we should be looking at this also as a way of moving away from the medical model of disability, not to get rid of doctors. We need them. Please, please don't take them away. <laughs> but we don't want to focus on the diagnosis or the expectation of recovery. When you do that, I mean, a diagnosis doesn't mean a disability. There are people with lots of diagnoses that the, you can have two people with the same diagnosis and one will work and one will not. So that's, you know, not really the, what the focus should be. And recovery or even medical improvement is neither a, a necessary nor a sufficient condition for return to work. There are people with long-term disabilities that are never going to change medically that do return to work and they're able to return to work. So we need to find the way looking possibly at the, using the functional model of disability, for example, that's used by the World Health Organization, incorporate technology and other um, aspects into the definition of disability so that we're not focusing just on what you can't do, but how you can do it. And I think that that really, it's time to start really placing that into the, the whole issue of, of demonstration projects and where we're going with disability policy. And I think it's, it will help people have their lives back as opposed to losing all that they can lose through not returning to work. Peer mentors uh, who have been through it, who know if they're given the training can help people kind of navigate the system and, and get to it. But I think that these demonstration projects all have that potential if we look at it from that functional model. Okay. Okay. All right, well, thank you to Annette Bribonair and Jennifer Sheehy for those very stimulating remarks. Uh, we're gonna open it up now to questions for the two discussants and for David Stapleton and just Reminders, when you ask a question, please state your name and affiliation. Limit yourself to one question. Uh, for those in the room, wait until the mic comes to you. And for those uh, online, there's still an opportunity to submit questions using the Q&A panel on the screen or, or Twitter using the R2W uh, policy hashtag. And so why don't we start with a question in the room? We have one 
up in front. I feel allowed to ask questions about your free co-author, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> actually, I'd like to make a contribution if I can. Uh, I'm Dr. Jennifer Christian. I'm a physician, and, I, and I, I think there is an idea that's really important to get out into the room, which is that more access to medical care is not what made the difference in COHI, and it's not what's making the difference in a lot of these programs. It is access to new kinds of services, uh, most of which have to do with communication, problem solving, et cetera. Uh, so the solution that, and this is particularly important in Washington State because there all the workers have complete access to healthcare services, right? But the outcomes are improving because of these unusual services. And the other interesting part about the COHI is they actually are being paid to do those new services. Um, and the second thing for, with regard to what Annette it was talking about is we really do have a vocabulary problem with the word disability that uh, I have been trying to encourage us to start using the word work disability for people who are either not working or not pulling full weight at work because of a health problem. And that, and that the impairment is really the other word here, is do you have some difficulty functioning, right? And as you were saying, there's no necessary connection between having a difficulty with some function and working. But if we use the same word, we get each other confused. That's, that's the only point I'm trying to make. Carmen, do we have any questions from the webinar audience? Yes, we do. Several, actually. Let me. So this question is from Lisa Golan, who's an attorney. Um, are you aware of any model programs to educate physicians on uh, the ADA, FMLA, or Rehab Act to enable them to better assist employers in remaining at work or returning to work? I guess Jennifer has. <laughs> yeah. uh, I've been involved actually in physician education for the last 10 years. Really, there probably is an, an occasional uh, session at a professional conference on the ADA. Um, we've actually, with my company, been involved with trying to em encourage employers and payers and agencies to institute systematic education of physicians, and they basically have been reluctant to do it. Um, not really being able to uh, speak with one voice to the medical profession that we need you to know some stuff and do some stuff you haven't been doing. Uh, one of the flaws in many physician education programs is they're taught by people with an administrative or legal focus, which just turns the doctors right off. So part of what this has to be is physician-centered and, and sensitive to the medical culture. If I, if I could add, I think, you know, I agree completely with you, Jennifer. But I think, again, it's important to recognize, you know, sort of all of the other pressures and, you know, sort of then demands on physicians' time, right? You know, many of these encounters focusing specifically on individuals with, uh, you know, work-limiting conditions or disabilities, for many physicians, they can be relatively low incidence events, you know, so sort of maybe they'll encounter a patient with these needs, you know, once every, you know, six months or something like that. So relative to all of the other demands on their time, you know, it's, it's just something claiming relatively limited attention. So again, you know, sort of it's, it's that, you know, what is the incentive for physicians to focus on these issues? Um, and absent, you know, some external broker, or someone facilitating these discussions again, it's it's uh, the incentives are just not aligned for it for it to work. All right, we'll take another question from the room. Um, I'm Dale Brown. I'm an independent disability policy consultant. I wanted to ask if anything had been looked at in terms of Office of Personnel Management and the disability um, retirement system. That seems like an area very ripe for savings. I was wondering if Gohe thought had been given to having COHE adapt, if there had been any studies, or just what's going on with that. Thank you. Well, I've thought about that. Uh, yeah, I've thought about it for several years, actually. And uh, I think one, one interesting thing about the federal government is that uh, as an employer, it pays for all health and disability benefits of its employees, whether it's through SSDI or Medicare, eventually, for those who leave the labor force or through federal pension, disability pensions. Uh, and of course, most federal employees have, are covered under some sort of federal employee health plan. And uh, so the, the federal government as an employer 
you know, it's, it's already incurring the costs of providing these services. Um, and I, I think the, uh, the Workers' Compensation Agency, which is in the Department of Labor, does do some things to coordinate uh, care, and they, you know, they have instituted some, had some initiatives to do that. But outside of that agency, I don't think there has been. And, and it's something I think the federal government should be doing. Um, there, are, there are programs in place um, pr to provide assistive technology that's it's actually run out of, I believe, the D Defense Department. Um, but there isn't a, a concerted effort that I'm aware of to provide coordination to individual cases uh, or to address what I think can be sometimes adverse incentives because of multiple types of benefits people are eligible for, uh, for staying in the workforce. And to my mind, the easiest way for the federal government to increase the number of uh, employed workers with disabilities is to keep the ones they already have, right? So, I don't know, Jennifer, you may want to weigh in on this one. <laughs> yeah, actually, I think uh, the uh, federal workers' compensation system uh, does a pretty good job of returning employees to federal employees to work and there are lessons there uh, that we can look at too um, a lot of these questions especially the physician education questions talk about communications and messaging and raising expectations and part of what we're doing in our office is trying to get that to employers and and help employers um, build a culture where people are ready to talk about what they need when they need it. Not about disability. It might not have to do with disability. It goes back to the, the language. You know, if they, and if you have a non-apparent disability, then you may not identify as a person with a disability, but you know that you might need uh, some flexibility in your schedule. You may need some leave or, or use the uh, FMLA or um, some type of equipment that will help you with your workstation or your computer, but you might not identify as a person with a disability. So we are uh, doing a couple of things. We're trying to help employers institute flexibilities and benefits across all their employee population not just for individuals with disabilities, but also to get that education to people when they come on board, when they are first hired, that there are accommodations that can be uh, requested, that the company is uh, supportive of employees and all sorts of health and life experiences. So uh, that hopefully will help raise expectations of employees, employers, the hiring managers, the disability insurers, and then ultimately when someone goes to a position, they will say, you know, how quickly can I go back to work, not just take care of my pain and send me home because I just can't get through the next 15 minutes. So that's, that's all part of, you know, or intervening earlier and earlier and earlier to, uh, to show people there are options. I believe it's one from the web now. Yes, um, this question is from Karen Millett. It's for Dave Stapleton. Um, who selects the COHI and who absorbs the cost of the COHI? Sure. Uh, the, the COHI organizations, there are six of them now, and they're, uh, they all are part of healthcare systems. I think uh, one is part of a big rehab hospital, and the other are parts of, <coughs> are within larger healthcare systems. Uh, the labor and industries, the workers' comp agency, uh, contracts with the COEs, pays them, and uh, they pay them on a case-per-case -case basis, uh, and they also pay the physicians for uh, the time they spend talking to the COE representatives, as well as um, uh, time for reporting, filling out certain forms that are required. Um, but I, I, th I think I think the selection process is really a contractual one, where the um, where it's this agency which is contracting with these organizations that have responded to opportunities. 
Um, if, if the question is concerning more who picks the particular individual who works with a particular claimant, um, I think that's pretty arbitrary. There's really no selection process. It's just, you know, they have people working in a room and they're working cases and new cases come up and they get assigned. Um, there may be some specialization, but I'm not aware of that. All right. Anyone else in the room? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Chris McLaren. I'm from the National Academy of uh, Social Insurance. And uh, I was actually I'm interested about these cohes as well. That in it, and I was wondering, um, it seems like there, it was also touched upon in, the, in uh, Ehrman's paper with the job retention. And I was wondering if there's specific aspects of these cohes that you found to be more effective than others. Or, or was, a, was it the coordinated effort or was it uh, certain certain aspects? Yeah, that's really hard to know. Uh, we, you know we know their overall effectiveness. Uh, we know they think everything they do is really important. <laughs> and, but it's really not possible, I think, to break out the individual things. I, I, I guess in observing them, I spent some time observing these healthcare service coordinators working. I was pretty impressed about how Routine it was what they were doing. You know, they're they're just looking, spending most of their time monitoring individual cases through electronic records and looking for problems, uh, going through checklists to see if problems had arisen. And you know, most cases they don't. They they only intervene in maybe 20, 25 percent of the cases. Um, and and um, and then, but then they have you know less of things that they can do if they see something that's going wrong, and they do it. Uh, but it's it's not it's not really high technology. They obviously have been trained and they learn through experience about things to do. Yeah, let's wait for the mic here. Oh. Yeah. Just to follow up, would you say they're almost like uh, expert claims adjusters? Kind of. Uh, what would you say their their specialty yeah. would be? I'm going to let the doctor answer that question. <laughs> so. I traveled with him, and I, I've been following Kohi for the last decade. <laughs> Actually, Washington State, when they talk about the program, the thing they're really emphasizing is that the physicians are doing best practices in communicating with their patient. It's David and I, when we went, we started to hear how important the role of these people they call the health service coordinators are. So it's really both. You have a doctor at the front end who's been trained in these best practices, best practices and is being incentivized to do them. And not only that, but actually they have a relationship with the health care service coordinator who gives them feedback once a year about whether they have actually been doing the best practices. And they're counting up. How many of your cases did you do them in? And by the way, you left money on the table because you didn't do these services for which you would have been paid, right? So it's a, do it's a relationship. So the, th the three elements that I would say they have is one is this teaching of best practices and incentivizing of best practices, and the second one is the coordination by the health care service coordinators who do tend to be trained VR people with about 20 years of experience a lot of times. They, they, they are working with the employer to teach the employer about return to work, to facilitate problems, and also to upgrade the performance of the doctors. So they're doing really both. And the third one is they really are establishing sort of a infrastructure in the community of a web of relationships. Because all the doctors in the state of Washington are not in the COVE. They sign up, they promise to do the best practices, and in exchange, they get the help of this healthcare service coordinator. We do have another question from the webinar. This is from P. Christine Schmidt. What can be done to change the employer view that people with disabilities returning to work are an increased liability and increased benefits expense. And thus, uh, employers might actually work to de-incentivize people with disabilities from returning to work. I mean, I'll take a, a I'll say a couple things about that. Um, I think the, the lessons are that if you intervene early enough, then you do reduce the medical costs, or it's not going to cost anymore when um, you bring someone back to work. And there are lots and lots of costs to employers for replacing someone 
who has, you know, a long time with the company as training and skills and, and equipment and um, a history and, 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 and knowledge. So there, you, you can't look at it simply as one individual, what is it going to cost me from here on out? And then not look at the whole context of the um, of the the person, the health, the insurance for the company, the the supports, the services, and and in the context of what they do for all the other employees as well, and what their front end costs are for job recruitment and um, and training. So. We do try to put that in context, and one of the things that we do with, in our office with employers, because we, we have a technical assistance center for employers, is to try to put all this in context so that they, we are really eliminating some of those mental attitude barriers to um, bringing employees back to work. I, I think it's, I, I agree with Jennifer, but I think it's important to add it, the, um, the value to the employer of bringing somebody back depends very much on the individual circumstances. And, uh, you know, if it's a, somebody with relatively low skills that can be replaced fairly easily, it's easy to hire somebody new and train them to the same point. Uh, that might be, from a pure profit perspective, much more attractive to the employer than than uh, retaining the worker uh, and you know waiting for them to come back after uh, six weeks, twelve weeks, or whatever it takes. So, it and and the reason I say that is partly because I don't. I think we have to be realistic about what we can expect employers to do. Uh, they're in this, you know, they're for profit, competitive. Labor markets, uh, they, they can't afford to be charitable institutions. And um, so they're looking at this fairly carefully. And um, I think a lot of the benefits accrue of getting the worker back accrue to the worker as, as well as to uh, federal programs that don't have to pay benefits as a result. So, so that's, uh, I think, an important lesson from the work that Yanni's done on the costs and benefits uh, that we really need to look carefully at making it in the employer's interest to uh, retain the worker and realize that the, that in cases where it's not in the employer's interest now, it's not just a matter of convincing them that it's the right thing to do. Uh, there's other things that need to be done. Yeah, and just to, to add a bit more detail, um, in, in my paper, and we also have a, a handout with the, with the examples from different states, that Oregon and Washington do provide an employment subsidy for workers and workers' compensation because they realize that they, there is a need at times to incentivize the employer uh, for the perceived difficulty of uh, hiring the person back, uh, returning them to work. I do have to say, though, this is Jennifer, that we have lots of examples where employers have taken their high turnover, low skill jobs and done massive recruitment for people with disabilities and then it looked after several years like they were finding just profit oriented bottom line savings and benefits. So it's it, it is sometimes those low-skilled entry-level jobs that employers have found that people with disabilities do um, make sense from a, a financial um, financial perspective too. This is Annette. Could I add just one resource for employers? Is the U.S. Business Leadership Network that provides information and. Um, information on best practices for employers and they they do a really good job and many states have their individual chapters as well. And they're employer to employers so if yes. you want to talk to a colleague rather than the federal government mm -hmm. they're good for that too mm -hmm. though we're not monitoring you. <laughs> <laughs> so at the risk of putting my foot in it, this is Jennifer Christian again, uh, in, the, in the commercial world uh, years ago when I was just putting my first <laughs> toe into the water and managing uh, 
episodes to try and reduce work disability. The senior vice president of the shipyard said to me, you know, Dr. Christian, the only cases that come to you are cases where there's trouble between the worker and the supervisor. And most times, if there's good relationships, uh, the employer will make more of an effort to help somebody stay at work. And I recently rode on the plane next to a guy that was the HR head operations for a very large company, and he more or less said the exact same thing. He said that if somebody has been a good employee and has a good attitude, they will really work to try and provide them alternative work. And if it's somebody they would just as rather be rid of, they are going to let them take the disability route as a mutual sort of conspiracy between the employee and the employer how to solve an interpersonal problem. So as long as we stay on the surface and we work on are you getting the right medical care and are we, uh, you know, are we give, doing your rights under the ADA and we're not actually addressing whatever problem solving interpersonal relationships exist, we will continue to see people follow that track. So I think part of what we're talking about in terms of preventing work disability is let's manage the real issue and see if we can resolve it. And I think this multi-party dialogue is one of the solutions that can be magical if you get a good facilitator for those conversations. I think this topic of employer engagement is really important both in, uh, in the context of disability employment support and just the workforce system more generally. And so perhaps we'll have another forum on this in the future. Uh, I'd like to thank our speakers once again for being here. And just as a reminder for you, there are comment cards in your packets. Uh, please let us know how we're doing by filling them out. And for the online audience, there should be an electronic survey coming your way. Thank you all for being here. Have a great afternoon.